Hello, welcome to Venture Capital. It's been a week of tensions. It started with the Swiss government voting for immigration limits for EU citizens, which would be OK, except the country is partly in the EU and enjoys the advantages of free trade. And this decision goes against the basic principles of the EU. So we'll have analysis to come on that one. And more tensions with Britain's Chancellor George Osborne making it clear that Scotland will not be able to break away from the UK as well as keep the pound. Meanwhile, the tensions on the streets of Ukraine continue as the economic situation in Ukraine worsens. That each situation is in some way connected with a desire to be independent, part of an economic unity, and the political tensions that result from both. So first of all, let's start with Britain right here. So as Scotland gets set to decide if they want to go solo and break away from the UK, George Osborne states that a yes vote in the referendum would also mean a yes to walking away from the pound. This is a direct blow to Scotland's First Minister Alex Salmond's independence campaign. Osborne said a currency union would cause great damage to both the UK and the Scottish economies, costing jobs and money which could result in UK taxpayers promising to bail out Scottish banks and damage the sterling's value in the international markets. At least that's what Osborne is saying anyway. So let's talk this through. We've got George Galloway right here. He's MP for the Respect Party in Britain. So the question is, to begin with, do you think that Mr George Osborne is using bullying tactics or has Mr Salmon's pick and choose options run out. Which side do you sit on? Well, I think that the sound and sight of George Osborne lecturing the Scottish people is a difficult one for many to swallow. But at the same time, his message is unequivocal and cannot be avoided. It is not possible to be an independent state whilst using someone else's currency. Uh, because the people who issue the currency, as opposed to use the currency, are the people who will set the conditions, the levels of public expenditure, the rate of taxation, and so on. All fiscal and monetary powers must obviously remain with the country that is issuing the currency. And uh, Mr. Salmond, I think, has made a huge blunder in claiming that you can have independence whilst using the UK pound. He ought to have had the courage of his convictions and said either that Scotland would have its own currency or would join the Eurozone. I know why he did neither of those. First of all, because the Euro doesn't have a particularly good name here and hasn't been going terribly well. And secondly, because the example of, say, Iceland or Slovakia, perhaps even better, where the Slovakian currency lasted for 37 days before the World Bank and the IMF moved in and effectively colonized the country, uh, was not palatable as an alternative. But uh, you can't really have an independent Scotland with an English queen, a UK pound, uh, still in NATO and subject to American-led uh, military political decisions, and of course also still be in the EU and subject to all the strictures that come with that. If there is a yes vote in September, what is the worst case scenario for the Scottish economy? Oh, the worst case is a race to the bottom. That's the worst case for the working people, at least. A race to the bottom provoked by a low tax, low public expenditure, Thatcherite Reaganomics regime in London forcing a Scottish state to chase them all the way to the bottom, to cut their taxes even lower, to make their public expenditure even less, to make even more people unemployed. And uh, Scotland would then be uh, independent in the sense that it could fly its own flag from Edinburgh Castle, uh, but the standard of living of people on both sides of the border, with virtually perpetual right-wing conservative rule in England, shorn as it would be of 59 anti-conservative MPs taken out of Westminster, that would be a disaster for working people on both sides of the border. And it's the interest of working people that I represent.
OK, George Galloway, we'll leave it there. Thank you for talking to us today. Very clear on where you set, uh, where you sit on the agenda there. Thank you very much indeed. And another political and economic relationship that is on tender hooks right now. This time it's between Switzerland and the European Union. Now, this is following the Swiss Parliament's decision to enforce a limit on the number of foreign migrants, including citizens of the EU. The EU has already started to retaliate to this by ruling that an energy treaty uh, that could potentially slash Swiss household spending uh, in the future on utility bills, that has been put on hold at the moment. Now, the Swiss, who are not full members of the EU, but part of the EU's free movement of people and goods, and that's exactly what the problem is. The country, they staged a referendum forwarded by the right-wing populist party, the UDC. But while immigration is the reason behind the new regulations, Swiss exports, 60 per cent of which make their way to the EU, and these could be at risk. So that's the situation. We're going to divulge in this a little further here. We're going to go to Zurich right now and speak to Hans Kaufmann. He's a Swiss politician. Hans, hello to you. Can you please tell me, do you think that Switzerland right now is risking the health of their exports, being that 60 per cent, as I mentioned, make their way to the EU? Uh, I'm not very afraid of sanctions in international trade. One should uh, think about the importance of Switzerland for the EU. We are a very huge uh, net importer of EU goods. As far as Switzerland is concerned, from where I see it, nothing positive can come out of this new ruling in terms of the economics. Yeah, I'm, I'm not very afraid. Uh, first of all, we will have three years to implement the details. So, uh, but the damage I has already been that, done. Uh, no, I do not, do not see any consequences, and we do not stop immigration. We just want to control immigration ourselves. That's what uh, but is, that is not the major picking change. And choosing? Is that not picking and choosing between parts of the EU that Switzerland want to be involved with, for example, trade, and parts that they don't want to be involved with, in other words, the free movement of people? Well, this uh, trade goes back to, uh, I think, 1972, has nothing to do with the bilateral agreement. And we pay a lot for the EU. Think about the big tunnels we built through the Alps, more than 20 billion US dollar. We have uh, donated more than a billion US dollar for the new 10 EU countries. So we do a lot for the EU and cherry picking. That's simply uh, not true. Uh, I. If I normally ask a politician, he should really give me in details uh, information which cherries he thinks about. Normally, then uh, they run out of ideas, with the exception of the free trade. But this free trade we have since 1972 and has no nothing to do with uh, the bilateral agreement on free movement of labor. And as far as the other four um, freedoms are concerned, like freedom of capital flows. Uh, everybody knows this is uh, not uh, really working. Hans, can I just question that? Because, say, for example, if France or Germany said that they too wanted this kind of an, an arrangement, so they wanted to do trade with the EU, but they didn't want immigration. Do you not think that that could cause massive problems? So if everyone had the same contract as Switzerland had, then the EU would be in big trouble, though, no? Yeah, but they have a much smaller portion of uh, foreigners in their country, only about uh, 9 per cent. We have uh, 23 per cent, and we have a lot uh, of foreigners which, uh, who have become Swiss. So we, we really have another uh, problem, and we Highly do not want to though, stop immigration. They? Yeah, but not all are highly skilled, and not all of the immigrants are from the EU. So uh, we have a, a problem as far as infrastructure is concerned, schools, uh, also our social network. And if you look at the criminality, 70% of the inmates of the prisons 
are foreigners. So we have a problem, and we just want to control it again. And uh, I would say we want a break uh, to sort out the problems, and then we can continue. All right, Hans, we'll leave it there. Thank you ever so much for taking the time to talk to me. I really do appreciate it. Credit rating agency Fitch has downgraded the Ukraine to triple C rating. This rating is reserved for vulnerable economies and means Kiev is now lower than Greece. The agency cites political instability as well as economic factors to justify this downgrade. Now, foreign debt is $140 billion right now. That's nearly 80% of the country's gross domestic product. The country is still battling riots on the streets. And as ever since President Yanukovych refused to sign a trade treaty with the EU and instead in December turned to Russia for monetary aid. But the $15 billion loan from Russia has been put on hold until a new government is formed. All right, let's now dive into the corporate world. We'll see what's been moving and shaking Russian companies this week, shall we? So one of Russia's oldest football clubs, Alania FC, has been kicked into financial liquidation. The players are now free to join other clubs. Alania owes over $28 million. Russia's largest car manufacturer, Aftivas, has set a date for plans to cut nearly 12% of its workforce this year. The job cuts will begin in May due to urgent measures to improve the company's financial condition. This is ahead of the soon-to-be-completed merger with Renault-Nissan Alliance. And two more Russian banks have lost their licenses this week, Eurotrust and Link. This is due to insufficient reserves and accusations of money laundering as well as bad customer service. Up to 50 Russian banks may have their licenses withdrawn in 2014. Following the 29 last year, as the central bank continues its quality cull. And staying with banks then, just last week, we were questioning if the banking industry was becoming more moral. Now, this suggestion was sparked by Barclays chief Anthony Jenkins waiving his million-dollar bonus. Well, the latest from the financial giant is that 12,000 people worldwide will lose their job this year. Uh, this is due to profits plummeting by 32%. But the reward for investment bankers was up 13%. So this is perhaps why uh, Mr Jenkins thought that it was wise to skip that juicy bonus. I'm sure there would have been a bit of a backlash had he not done so. So profits down, but bonuses for bankers. Guys, I give up. I thought they were getting more moral. Forget about it. All right, I'm going to be on Twitter this week, of course. You can join me then. I'll be keeping you up to date with the business world. So have a fantastic week and thanks for watching.